Hello everyone, today is Thursday, January 2nd, 2014. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but I, I think we have enough to cover this week to uh, get jacked up on some Mountain Dew. I'm actually out of Mountain Dew this week. I need to remember next time I go to the store. So we're going to substitute Diet Coke. I might not be as jacked up this week as, as I normally am. All right. I'm going to wait for the bubbles to go down. I read on, um, what was it, Yahoo. I always get stuck reading those Yahoo stories whenever I go to Yahoo Finance or whatever. It's like halfway there. It's like, stewardesses don't like Diet Coke because it fizzes too much. It's like, okay. Well, it's no Mountain Dew, but not bad. All right, enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, if you've been trading for more than a day or two, you can lose money trading. Or, as I um, as I like to say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor, if you don't mind, throw me a bone on Amazon.com. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of people here, or more people here, I should say, than there are reviews, so somebody's holding out on me. Uh, even if you just say, hey, I liked uh, those other reviews on um, That's a Layman's Guide to Trading, obviously. Um, what are we going to talk about? Well, I want to talk about 2014 and all the predictions are beginning to come out, obviously. And you need to ignore those uh, <laughs> at all costs. But I'm going to give you my predictions. And um, based on a column I wrote a couple days ago on New Year's Eve, at least, uh, don't worry about 2014. And that's going to make a lot more sense in a few minutes uh, based on the email somebody sent me. Uh, your best defense is still a good offense. We'll flesh that out, too. And, obviously, if there's anything you want me to cover, uh, we could uh, we could try to cover it on the fly, or we could certainly use it as fodder for next uh, week's show. Howard's asking me, number one long idea in holding for 2014. Well, those are the type of predictions that I would like to avoid because I think that um, – I think you can only predict the short term when it comes to markets, and I'm going to flesh that out in just one second. And that's something I preach daily, too. Anyway, uh, so what do I predict for 2014? This was in a column a couple days ago, and sometimes I'll write something, and it'll just come out, and then I'll have a little time to digest it over the next few days or weeks, and then I'll go back and think, you know what? That made a lot of sense. And it's as much of an exercise for me as it is, or it's as good as, you know, it helps me as much as I think it might help you uh, when um, when I think it's relevant like this. So here are my New Year's re resolutions. First of all, what are my predictions for 2014? Okay, we could maybe talk about number one idea, uh, uranium. How's that? I'll just throw that out. Uh, but I think the markets are going to go up. I think they're going to go down. And I also think they're going to go sideways, okay? So my prediction is... A non-prediction, okay? So I'm going to attempt to follow the markets the best I can during the up part and the down part. Now, follow is a key word in that sentence. I'm not going to try to predict the markets. At least I'm not going to try to predict the markets any further than the short term, okay? And then I'm going to try to stay out of the market as much as possible during the sideways part. Well, as I often preach, a lot of times a portfolio ebb and flow will help you with that part of things. It'll knock you out of one side of the portfolio or the other or both, and then you'll be left flat during a sideways market. And then the third thing I want to do is I'm going to use money management and position management. I'm going to wait for entries. I'm going to take partial profits as offered. I'm going to trail stops higher and lower. And I'm going to honor my stops to help me with the number one and the number two part. So again, one second. So again, stops and trailing stops at the position management are going to take me out of trends when they begin to end. They're also going to take me out of the markets when they get a little choppy, and then I might end up just sitting on my hands for a while. And entries are also going to keep me out of markets 
when they may not be following through. Not all the time, but a lot of times, as throughout 2013, I showed countless examples, especially when the market got a little iffy for a while here and there, where simply waiting for an entry kept you out of trouble. Now, the point I want to drive home today, and, and maybe even throughout the year, especially since I just did the, the whole webinar on a good offense, on the stock selection, so I know my best defense is a good offense, so I'm going to pick the best and leave the rest. I know it's easier said than done because we always sometimes feel like, we always sometimes? We always feel like as traders we must be taking action, we must, be do, we must do new things. It's human nature to know deep down that if you don't take action, you're not going to get paid. And that's true even in the markets. If you just sit on your hands all next year, well, you're going to end up, no better than where you started. You might make a 1% or so on interest, but that's about it. So it is kind of hard to sit in, your, sit in your hands when there's nothing going on, but sometimes that's the best thing to do. you got to realize that digging a hole is not necessarily a good thing. So don't invent trades, and I got that from Peter Monthy. We were on a project together last year, I think, and um, he came up with that, which I thought was pretty good, early last year, and, and, and it really stuck with me, and I quote him all the time on that. So if the trade isn't there, I'm not going to force it, and I'm going to print this off, and I'm going to actually follow this this year, and I think this is going to, if anything, from a selfish standpoint, I think it'll help me. Now, I got an email from someone who's worried about not getting enough um, winners in 2014. He's also worried about, and I'm kind of mixing up, I guess, a couple of emails here, but uh, one gentleman's also worried about the risk versus reward. Well, I'm not going to go into that too much today. I will show you one little thing. And it's kind of the beat the dead horse example on that, but I will show you one little thing on that. But go in and watch uh, the risk versus reward webinars that I did. I covered it completely in one session. I followed up in two or three more sessions. So those were some of the better sessions, I think, in 2013. So go in and watch those. Uh, pick up those individual shows. And by the time you pick up all three or four of them, you, it'd be just cheaper to get the whole year on that. Shameless plug. But there's some good information in there. And it's like instead of spending three pages of an email, given the answer, I think you're much better off going in and watching that webinar on risk versus reward. But it seems to be this general worry that's out there about 2014. And my approach is going to be the same approach that I had in 2013 and in 2012 and in 2011 and just keep going back in time. And I know that only the short term can be predicted with any degree of accuracy. So that's very important and that takes the pressure off that takes the pressure off of what am I going to invest in in 2014? I get asked all the time, a friend's wife, a few weeks back, Dave, what's, what's the best thing to invest in? I'm like, well, I, I like this particular stock at this moment, but I don't know it would be an investment. If it triggers an entry and follows through, then maybe it could turn into an investment. But there are no good investments, and I think you need to write that down. There are no good investments, but they might be something that might be worthwhile as a trade, and it might be worthwhile to stick with it longer term as long as it continues to move in your favor. So yeah, that could turn into an investment. But remember, you can only predict the short term. So you need to do that and then stick around for the longer term should things pan out. I guess I should have put that in there. Now, you want to take things one day at a time, and the headlight analogy kind of comes to mind. If you're driving from, let's say, New York to L.A., uh, it's going to take you a while. You're going to have to do some driving at night, okay? Well, your headlights aren't going to, aren't going to shine the uh, West Coast, at least certainly when you're starting out. They're only going to shine a few hundred feet ahead. So it's kind of like that in the markets. You only need to see what's happening or you only need to predict with some degree of accuracy, what's going to happen over the very short term. So don't outdrive your headlights and try to figure out what's going to be the big investment for 2014 right now. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, last year, if somebody would have guessed solar, it would have been a good guess, and it turned out to be one of the bigger winners of 2014. We did have a few solar stocks set up way back in January. I'm sorry, way back in December of 2012. 
So maybe that was a clue back then. But we didn't know that they were going to turn into some of the biggest winners of the year. So one of the emails I received was from a preacher, so I think this is uh, relevant. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, and that's Matthew 6.34. And I'm always saying, take things one day at a time. And the other thing, again, I can't beat the dead horse on this enough, is don't invent trades. Okay? Now, I'm a little philosophical on you today, but I really think that this is some good stuff for the next 12 months, for the next year, for 2014. Okay, do your homework and say, does this trade really, potential trade, really have some incredible potential to it? Okay, does this trade, or does this trade have the potential to A, make a quick reversion to the mean move in the direction of the longer term trend? In other words, is it a good swing trade? Is it a really good swing trade? Is it the best of the best that I could find? Okay. Does it also have longer term potential? Now you can't predict, I just got through saying you can't predict the long term, but you can certainly look at the chart and say, well, does it have long term potential? Well, how do you do that? Well, if it's making a major transition in trend off the lows and it pulls back and it's a good looking setup and there's no overhead resistance, then maybe, maybe it could be a major new trend developing. If it's already in an established uptrend and there's no bad memories, meaning, again, overhead resistance, and it's been in a very persistent uptrend and it's been in a very, it's been in a very uh, let's say, accelerating uptrend and you got a great looking setup like a TKO or something, then maybe it has both short-term and longer-term potential. And if other stocks within the same sector also look pretty good and the sector itself looks pretty good and the market itself is in a trend, and at or near new highs, then maybe it might be worthwhile. But you will only know until you take the trade and see how things pay, pan out. And then again, you only take the trade if what? It triggers an entry. Now, just make sure, again, you really like to trade. Don't invent trades. And I've told the story several times that it was a very valuable uh, lesson for me, at least it, at least it, it um and not being pressured into something. I was asked to be part of this team a while back, as I often say, and then um, Peter Mothy was the head of the team, and and I said, Peter, you don't understand. I was like, there's going to be times, weeks and maybe even months, where I might not have much, if anything, to submit to this project, and, and the only way for me to get paid on the project was to submit trades. And that's just how things worked out. I wasn't getting paid a salary to be on a team. I, I got paid a percentage of uh, the amount of trades that were submitted by me compared with everyone else. And he says, that's okay. He goes, you're exactly the guy we want. We want a guy that's going to sit back and not invent trades and only give us something when he thinks he has something that's worthwhile. So I love that. Don't invent trades. And I can't beat the dead horse uh, enough on that. Put that on a sticky and stick it on your monitor. And I think that uh, I think your life's going to get a lot better with that. So just make sure you really, really like that setup before taking it. And I think if there's anything I could say other than the obvious, like body management, position management, and wait for energies and wait for energies, wait for entries, blah blah blah. I think the best thing I could tell you is just be selective and pick the best and leave the rest. Now, do I worry? Yeah course I do. Do I get stressed out? Of course I do. Am I interviewing myself? Yes, I am. Uh, when I was putting together the stock selection webinar on the Friday before I, I gave it, it was on the Saturday, on December 14th of last year, a little bit, um, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was worried. I was stressed out because I did a little pre-scan. I didn't do my whole analysis. I thought it'd be better for me to do the analysis in front of everyone to see, and I didn't want to have uh, too much of a, not necessarily a bias. I didn't want to have it done. If I had it done ahead of time, I, th I think I would go too fast. So I wanted to do as much in real time as possible. But I did do a little bit of a pre-scan 
right around the market close just to see what was going on. And, and I went home and I told my wife, I said, uh, Marcy, I said, she says, uh, you look kind of, uh, you stressed out about tomorrow? What's, you look a little nervous. And I said, well, and, and I know I've told this before, but I think it's worth telling again. It's like as far as giving a presentation, I'm I'm kind of a ham. I always get a little nervous and little butterflies, but I'm pretty much a ham. I love doing this. Obviously, I wouldn't be talking to you today if I didn't love do the, doing this. This is just a, I just have a blast doing this. Uh, but I was worried that I wouldn't be able to find any setups. I was gi I'm giving a whole webinar on how to select the best stocks, and I was a little worried because doing the pre scan, I didn't see a whole lot out there. And she said something that was very philosophical and she's pretty she's pretty good when it comes to grounding and all she's learned enough about this business through osmosis to really help me out and she said well isn't that one of the most important lessons if there's nothing to do then you shouldn't do anything and I'm like yeah you're right you know so I went into it said well worst case we won't find anything and then hopefully in the follow-up sessions we'll find something worthwhile but luckily things did turn out okay but remember that is a valuable lesson. Although it did turn out great this time, it won't always turn out so great when you do your analysis. In other words, you might not always have those great looking setups. Now, with that said, let's take a look at what actually happened. And we're going to revisit this. Uh, I think it'd be fun to kind of revisit this uh, throughout the year. My fat fingers some things. Okay, here we go. So he's, here are the stocks that were on my Landry list for the 16th. So I went in and did a scan up until yesterday's close on what's changed in those setups. And I forget what the market is up, a couple of percent, I think, since then. So you can see that these inefficient stocks and setups have worked out pretty good. And this was obviously the big winner in here up. 58%. Uh, this one is actually currently in the portfolio. And this was the other one that I recommended here on that particular day. Uh, this one did trigger right away, so I took it off the official recommendations, but some people actually took the setup. Now, I'm not showing you this to brag. Well, maybe a little bit, okay, because I'm proud of it, obviously. But I'm showing you that if you work hard, you can find these market inefficiencies, these these 18 to 15, 18 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, 60 percent moves that are possible over a short period of time. And then once you get in these, you can hang around for hopefully a much uh, bigger, bigger move longer term. I don't know why I circled that one. This is the one that actually triggered and hit the initial profit target. I'll show you that one in just one second. So that's what came out of it. And this is what a good offense looks like. Now, I, I probably should say results not typical in all the other caveats, but what's cool about this was that this was one reason I was a little nervous because put my neck on the line, okay, um, put my neck on the line, head on the block, what's the, uh, put my head on the block, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's, it's kind of scary to come out and do something in real time and see what happens, and I think that the market is the ultimate arbiter, in this particular case, it worked out pretty good so this is what's possible in here okay and this one here may or may not have triggered we'll take a look at these in just one second okay now I do want to show you a snapshot of the portfolio and what's going on now and I know we beat the dead horse of this SPWR the reason this one's still in here I have it up here this is because it's on a discretionary basis this one actually nicked the stop at nine if you remember and I know some of my clients are like rolling their eyes like please stop uh, the stop was at nine. The stock went down to nine, and then turned around, and went straight back up. Okay, exactly nine, never eight fifty nine or below. And the point I'm trying to make, or want to continue to make here, is that these outliers can make all the difference in the world. This is on a one hundred k account. Okay, so you could do the math um, with different size accounts if you want, but one hundred k makes a good round number. So round numbers, that's 25% gain on that portfolio of 100K. Now, the gentleman that emailed me earlier, uh, we were earlier talking about, one of his big concerns is that these occasional big winners aren't going to be big enough to make a difference in the portfolio because we're selling half of the position, and this is only a one-half position that's left. Okay, So the original trade was 2,000 shares. 
And yeah, if you had both two, you had both positions, then you'd be up fifty thousand dollars on this position. Okay, but we didn't know it was going to turn into this, so we took that short-term profit, and then we kept the piece longer term. Now you can't get greedy, and you can't have your cake and eat it too, and say, "Well, I want to have this big, huge position for this longer-term trend," because you don't know if that longer-term trend is going to materialize. So. I don't know for a fact that we're going to have some big winners like this next year. I sure hope so, and I'm sure going to work hard at it, and I'm going to do the same exact thing that I did to find this stock next year and some of those other solar stocks like SCTY, which was a huge winner over the year. And you only need a few of those each year to make your year, okay, these inefficient stocks that have the potential to make huge moves much bigger than the market. For instance, this this one right here, 60% move in a couple of weeks. Well, the market will never go up 60% in a couple of weeks. Well, maybe in 1999. No, even in 1999, it didn't go up that much, okay? In a few weeks at least. So these stocks are inefficient. Everything isn't priced into these stocks already. These 20 and 30% moves, okay, aren't priced into those stocks. Otherwise, they would have been that much higher a few weeks ago, and then the price would be unchanged since because that was priced in to the stock. Now, I just want to show you a couple of things, a couple of musings with the portfolio. When you look at the actual portfolio, a lot of these things sort of come out. And one thing we talked about, we just talked about the outliers. So these outliers are very important. Now, I'm hoping that every stock in here becomes an outlier. I'll point to my screen. <laughs> I'm such an idiot. Uh, but anyway, we do have one in here that's doing okay. It's up about 20% and looking pretty good. And we got a couple other big, a uh, couple other winners that hadn't turned into big winners. But the point I want to make on this one is maybe this will turn into the next big outlier, and then that's going to make this number here look a lot different or a lot better. Notice that almost half of this number here is just this one stock. So it's very important to capture those important outlier type of trades. I don't want to make it sound like it's elusive because you just you do the same thing on every trade. You make sure it has the potential to become a longer term winner and you never know exactly which one that's going to turn into. And the other thing you do is you don't second guess it. You don't get out because you think it's going sideways or flat. You honor your stops. Even if the even if the position starts looking ugly from a technical analysis standpoint and looks like it might be rolling over or it might not ever work out, you still hang with it and just honor your stop. You plan your trade and you trade your plan. Now, the trade to plan part is very hard for most people. And I guess if i got to throw out one more thing for 2014, plan your trade and trade your plan. You'd be surprised how few people could actually do that, although to me it seems fairly simple okay so again the outliers are going to be pretty important so hopefully we end up with a few outliers the other thing I want to talk about is a balanced portfolio and I think a balanced portfolio at least long versus shorts is like um, Bigfoot and the Yeti and uh, what else, what else? Uh, Loch Ness Monster or something I don't think it, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty elusive and it's pretty hard to actually do if not impossible uh, so don't you can't go out and think that oh because I got approached by a hedge fund a while back wanted to do long short half longs half shorts and my point is that I really don't think it's going to work now it can work over short periods of time and right now you can see we've got a couple of shorts in here actually three shorts okay and then everything else is long anything with a minus in front of it is a short and so far only one of these shorts has actually worked out okay. And the other two are actually in the negative column. But like, what's pretty cool, and this doesn't happen that often, so I want to say results not typical. But you come in in a morning like this morning, and I took the snapshot early this morning. Those shorts, most of the gains, if not all of the gains, at least early this morning, right before I took the snapshot at least, um, before some of those longs turned around. But most of the gains coming into today were along, so I'm sorry, on the short side. So it's kind of cool to have some shorts or to have the market sell off. That won't always happen. The reason we have these, we didn't put these shorts on yesterday. We didn't put these shorts on last week. These shorts have been on for a while. The reason they've been on is because a few weeks back, the market looked a little iffy, looked a little questionable, and the database started spitting out a few shorts. 
We thought they looked good, so we took them, okay? And that's why they're in here. I'm not trying to run this balanced portfolio. I don't care if I get stopped out on these shorts. In fact, I wish we could stop out of these shorts and have the market go to the moon and we make a fortune on the long side, okay? But in the meantime, let's just see how sh things shake out. Dave, the market's making new highs. Should you exit all your shorts? Nah, I don't know. Leave them on. What the heck? What's the worst thing that could happen? Get stopped out on them and the market goes higher? I wouldn't mind that at all. I just said that, right? So that's uh, something that's kind of interesting in there. So I don't have any big outliers to show you at the moment. Maybe this one will turn into something pretty big, okay? We're not going for this $1,000 gain or 1% gain in a portfolio. We're going for a 25% gain, something like this, okay? We're going for maybe a 500% move, and that's what we're doing. Now, it's not that we're swinging for the fence every time, but we're hoping that, and I hate to use too many sports analogies, but we're, we're hoping that that, um, we're hoping that that little, uh, I'm, I'm going to say chip shot or whatever, we're hoping that, that that small piece could turn into something much larger, okay? Missed the first six slides in 12 minutes of webinar. Can I go back, find the slides of Dave's first 12 minutes of talk? Today's, uh, what I do is I do record these, and they're available for a, a small nominal charge just to cover the cost of uh, the webinars and all. There's, it's a few thousand dollars a year to, to do these webinars, but, hey, I don't mind. Um, but, yeah, you, you could always go back and get them, and if you want the whole archives, I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. Anyway, any questions on... I don't want to get too much into risk versus reward, but my, my whole point, because I've, I've beat the dead horse on that plenty of times, but my whole point is these outliers can't make a big difference. Uh, also, by looking at this portfolio, there's a lot of things that it tells you is that, well, we did have some shorts a while back. Two out of three of them aren't really working that well just yet, okay, and maybe never, okay. But that was what the database offered, and that's what we took. So the reason I'm, I'm kind of uh, talking about that so much is that I wasn't trying to predict the longer-term market. I was just taking what the database gave me. And then, fortunately, I'm happy that the market is much higher now. And it did not roll over when it sort of looked like it might. And if you go back a few weeks and you look at some of the web-based commentary, Boy, I tell you, especially if you're a member of some forums like I am, and, and even these professional forums where these people get very bearish very quick. And it's like, as a trend following moron, I'm never going to be that smart. And sooner or later, they're going to get it right. But more often than not, they're going to be wrong, and the longer-term trend will prevail. But I know I don't have to grab that top or pick that top. If I see some short setting up, I begin to take them. And getting back to the ebb and flow, we had three shorts on. There was a fourth short that looked pretty darn good, but I'm like, geez, you know, oh, geez, as we say in Fargo, we're getting a little too close. We're getting a little too many shorts on, and this market is really not following through one way or the other. So I showed my peeps. Okay, here's another short, Rost, R-O-S-T. But I think we've got enough in the portfolio. Let's not go crazy on the short side while the market is really not that far from its all-time highs. I think three is probably enough. And, of course, regrettably, the stock imploded. But, hey, if you're willing to live with that, it's okay. You can't kiss all of the women, okay? You brought up an excellent point. Taking partial profits takes the stress out of the remainder position. Fewer stress decisions makes for a better trader. Yeah, and, and I've yet to come up with a better analogy but once I get that initial profit target, because a lot of times I recommend the stock and people will be like two days later, it'll be up significantly, but it hasn't hit the profit target yet. And they'll be like, oh, Dave, that's a great pick. And I'm like, well, settle down, Beavis. Let's not start kissing each other just yet. Let's wait until at least that partial profit target gets hit before we start high-fiving, okay? Because I don't view a position as a winning position until it hits that initial profit target, I take those profits off, those partial profits at least, and I have that stop and break even. Then it becomes, and I hate to use the analogy, but a free position. And then at that point, you're playing with the market's money. Now, I know it's still your money, but that's probably the best way I could see it. And that's one way that I've got my 
head wrapped around it longer term. Once I get that initial profit target, I'm able to sit back and relax, haha, and ride out that position. And I know it's going to whack me here and there, but as I preach quite often, if you're not willing to stick with that position and let that 100% profit draw down a little bit to maybe a, even a 75% profit, then you're never going to get 200% profit. So if you take profits at 100%, you'll never get a 200% winning trade. You'll never get a 400% winning trade if you stop yourself out at 200. Okay, So you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits. But yes, from a psychological standpoint, and again, I'm often asked, Dave, is your money management statistical or psychological? And my answer is yes. Yes. Take those partial profits. It, it, we have this need for short-term fulfillment. Microwaves, okay? <laughs> Microwaves, cable on demand, download your movie, okay? Everything is instant nowadays, okay? Nobody waits for anything. Um, somebody buys something from me, and it's like a download, and I've got to manually process it. Ten seconds later, i got an email. Where's my download? It's like, oh, gosh. Give me a minute, <laughs> you know, but that's the society we live in, and that's how I think that's ingrained in us now. We, 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 there's no way of getting around that. So, but I, too, want some immediate satisfaction. I don't want to wait, okay? So that taking that initial profit target sort of strokes that, that, that ego, that need for that, that initial satisfaction that immediate satisfaction. And the longer term trend not only is where your money is and what makes your portfolio work longer term, but it also strokes that ego for capturing that longer term trends, those longer term trends. I want to go out and say we made 600% in this little solar stock or 300% or whatever the case may be, or maybe 1,000% in the biotech. Who knows? Okay, those – Results not typical, but certainly possible if you're following a trend-based methodology with a hybrid approach, going in for a short-term gain, and keeping a piece of that position on for what hopefully turns into a longer-term trend. Okay, have you ever taken a third or fourth profit, profit and let the trade run to maximize profits? No, because if you start taking little pieces out, um, you're going to end up with not enough profit if the trade doesn't materialize, okay, and have too much on. So uh, it's not going to work. You know, if you keep selling little pieces, then you're going to run out. You're going to you're going to sell too much, okay? If you sell little pieces at a time, or if you're just kind of, or you're not selling enough to make it worthwhile, and then you end up with a three-quarter position on when it tanks on you and you don't get enough. 50-50 seems to be the right number. Now, there are cases where we'll come in and we'll have a huge windfall overnight, and I'll say, guys, let's not be too greedy. Yeah, it's okay to sell some of that position off, okay? As I tell some of my clients, sell down to the sleeping level, okay? That's an old Wall Street adage, adage where you exit enough position of enough of the position to where it doesn't stress you out, and you can sleep at night. Now, keep in mind, um, I know there's some new faces here today. So keep in mind, it's not my way or the highway. If you have your own way of doing things, then by all means, you can do them, okay? Do, do whatever works for you, but I'm showing you what works for me, and maybe you can take a little bit of my stuff and make your stuff even better, okay? Yeah, Leon, uh, I like the 50-50. Um, you know, years ago, I called it grandma money management. Uh, many years ago, I lived in Mississippi uh, when the, uh, for a brief spell at least, where the casinos were first um, showing up, and it seemed like these little old ladies, the little grandmas would take their 20 bucks down there, and they'd play with 20 bucks, and if they'd win 20 bucks, they'd put 20 bucks in their left pocket, and they leave the other 20 bucks in the machine, or put 20 bucks back in the machine, however you want to look at it. But they'd start with 20, and as soon as they win 20, they'd keep that 20 and then play with the rest. 
and I called it Grandma Money Management. Well, I hate to use these gambling analogies. That's why I don't say that too much anymore. But it's sort of like Grandma Money Management. You take a little piece off. You get your, you know, to where you break even on the rest. And then if it works out, that's fantastic. If it doesn't work out, then so what? Better than poke the eye on the trade. Now, of course, you occasionally lose on one or two or maybe three or four or more. And then, but hopefully longer term, these one or two big winners will make all the difference in the world. And in the meantime, every now and then you get lucky. Not that it always happens, but every now and then you get lucky where you get partial profits stopped out, partial profits stopped out, partial profits stopped out. And that happens enough to where even if you get stopped out at a full position, you actually slowly make a little bit of money even in less than ideal conditions. And then eventually, like I said earlier, those stops and, and trailing stops and position management will have you flat even if the market begins to turn um, sideways. Jonathan, Jonathan says, it's great that you're discussing the mental side of exiting positions. I'd welcome hearing one more time the theory behind not getting out when the dollar amount might be so attractive. Hey, I'm up 8000 in two days, and that's nice for me. So I'll sell out a week later, it runs another 50%. Kind of sucks. Yeah, and that's the hard part, Jonathan. I did a webinar, I don't know if it was this year or, la or I should say 2013 or 2012. It, we archive all these things. Okay, I don't give them away. I'm not that uh, I'm not that generous, but we archive these things. And one of the things that came up was, and for lack of a better way of putting it, you have to be a greedy bastard when it comes to profits. So you said eight thousand in two days. Well, that's not enough. That's it's never enough because you're always going to have losses because it is a tough game. When you make money, you have to make hay when the sun shines. And you have to keep making money. You have to make as much money as possible. You need that 500% winner. Don't quit when you're up 200% because it might go to 500%. Oh, but Dave, maximum adverse uh, reward uh, theory says that you're never going to, you're rarely going to get that 500%. So what? Okay? So what? It's possible. And that's going to make your whole year, or certainly, a big piece of your year. So it's never enough. But, yeah, make sure you're taking partial profits off and be willing to give up some of those open profits. And I'm real – it's funny. We get some of these winners in here, and it's like I'll come in day after day. And every now and then they get whacked a little bit, but I'll say, you know what? I'm just going to let it go because that's just – that's my winner. That's my favorite. And I don't want to digress too far, but it's, it's sort of interesting. It's sort of like – a a lot of people new to trading, not you guys here, because I think you're a little bit more advanced than the rest of, of, of the people because you're actually <laughs> studying the markets and, and spending time on your Thursday to go to a webinar right around the holidays when there's so much going on. So kudos to you. But an analogy I've thought of recently, it's like, okay, you've got four employees, and one employee just busts his butt. Works from dusk to dawn. He's just pounding it out every day. And the other three employees are just kind of stinking up the joint, taking up space, wasted air, waste of oxygen, okay? So are you going to fire that good employee and keep those three crappy employees because you think that they're due to start working because they haven't worked in so long? No, you're going to do just the opposite. You're going to get rid of the the dead weight, and you're going to keep the, the one that's doing really well. Well, it's so funny in the markets, just the opposite happens. And I think it was uh, Art Cashin said, I'm quoting Art Cashin through Dave Mecklenburg, who's um, a friend of mine, a business associate also, but uh, he's often quoting Art. But Art says that we're not wired to trade, and I believe that Art is right. And what Art has done is he's a mechanical guy. I'm not a big fan of mechanical systems. But he's a mechanical guy, and that's his way of wrapping his head around the fact that we're not wired to trade. So my way of wrapping my head around we're not wired to trade is to, number one, pick the best stocks going in. Don't try to invent trades. Pick the best of the best, okay? Because once – if you've got a good offense, you, you, you're 99% there. The other 1%, okay, you're 95%. Let's go 95%. And the other 5% is 2.5% mental and 2.5% your money management and your position management, okay? 
Now, I'm exaggerating on those. Maybe it's one-third, one-third, one-third. But you get the idea. Money management and the psychology are two very important aspects of the trade. But if you got your good, if you have a good trade going in, those other two are going to fall more into place. So that's why I overemphasize that. And that's why we spent a whole weekend just talking about how to pick stocks. Okay, and my way of wrapping my head around it is that okay, if I get that partial profit out. The worst I could do, barring overnight gaps, of course, but the worst I could do is break even. I now have a free position, okay? So this free position in this OCIP right here, the remaining shares over here, hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we come in a year from now, okay, and we come up here, and this is where I think the flash drives are good because you can go in and, and you can see how things work. Good, bad, or indifferent, but hopefully we have a gain like that at the end of the year, okay? All right, lots of great questions come in. Thank you so much. I read this recently. We take profits early because we want to prove we were right. Yeah, Leon, that's perfect. That's exactly, that. yeah, we have a need to be right. We have a need for, we have a short-term need for fulfillment, okay? Uh, Freshman psychology reared its ugly head here. We have a short-term need to be right, okay? So, that's why that's why micromanagement is one of the biggest problems I see in trading. People micromanage themselves out of trades all the time. Okay, um, we got along this tan weeks back, and it's been stinking up the joint. Okay, let's see if I can get my pen to work. We got long this, and you can see this is a big fat loss here, eight percent loss. Okay, you can see we got a loss there. But what's happening today? Well, it's got a pretty serious rally going on, and it might take off, and it might work out. Now, when we got into the position, it was a perfect setup, or as perfect as you're going to get. It looked pretty good, and that's why we went in. You would, I, would, I wouldn't rush out and buy it today, but if you're already in it, let things pan out. Most people can't sit around for things to pan out. The, the example that I use quite often, we were long a stock, and this has happened multiple times, but we were long a stock a while back. It triggered a pullback, and then it went straight sideways. It did absolutely nothing. But it didn't do anything wrong. It didn't hit the stop. It didn't even come close to the stop. It's actually slightly profitable for a week or two. It might have even been a couple of months. And then the stock got bought out. So overnight, the stock doubled. But a lot of people, oh, that's dead money. I'm not making any money on that. I better move away. I better go on. Okay, Dave, you were wrong. You're not right. I'm not right. You're not right. We're not right. So let's get out. And I've seen it happen even shorter term than that. I've seen people get out two or three days into a trade and then have that trade double overnight. Okay. So micromanagement is the biggest problem because we have a need to be right. We also have that need for short-term fulfillment. Microwaves, downloadable movies, the whole nine yards. Jonathan said 8% loss on 10 when your stops have kicked in by now. No. No, because it depends on the volatility of the stock, okay? Uh, this OCIP, pretty volatile stock, okay? We had a 13% stop in that one, okay? And I know it was a 13% stop because my initial profit target is the same as my stop. So I can tell you just by looking at the spreadsheet, that was a 13% stop. We had a 16% stop, 16%, oh my word, stop in AERI. Well, you don't rush out and put your whole portfolio in that stock, especially because, let's say if you did, you could lose at least 60% of your portfolio in the stock, maybe even more if it implodes, okay, and that stop goes, goes zooming by the stop. But you take a position size that's small enough to where – you could survive, and if you look up here, you can't see the whole spreadsheet, but you're taking 2% per position. Now, if you go in, I don't want to explain the entire methodology and the money management in just one session, but if you go in and watch the old ones, then you'll see, okay? AERI daily volume is very light. It be, doesn't meet your stock selection criteria. It did at the time. It's, it's, the stock was not, it was trading enough shares to where it was worthwhile trading, okay? 
And we were not concerned. About, yeah, Leon went on to say we were not concerned about maximizing profit, just that we were right. Yeah, and that's my favorite. My fa- you know, what's amazing to me is I, I am so amazed at how right, how people would rather be right than make money. And I talk about that quite often. People will, I'll show them a chart and say, we got in here and, you know, it's up 300% here. And it's like, well, it went sideways for a little while. If you if you'd have used a trend line, you'd have gotten out in that sideways range. Well, you could see the whole chart. Why would you get out? Why would you tell me I should have gotten out on a chart that you could see the whole chart when the right side is higher than the left? But people want to be right. People want to, they have a need to be right. Okay. Each day has ebbs and flows, so you might get stopped out during lunchtime or between noon to three due to activities, and then of course it runs the highs of three thirty. You're not so you're you're honoring your stops yet losing out. This seems to happen a lot. Okay, Jonathan, your problem is your stops are too tight for the time frame that you're trading. Okay, I want to be in a stock ten years from now. So let's just take a look at this real quick. Okay. Now, I use a short-term stop. I want to be able to ride out at least a short-term move. And then hopefully that short-term move turns into something much larger. So my stop hopefully is far enough away to ride out at least a week or two of market gyrations should the trend not continue right away. So say we trigger, it begins to bounce around. Hopefully it will take off, and I'll have enough room between my entry and where the stop is. If you're trying to hold on a multi-day period and intraday the market does this and you're getting stopped out time after time after time, then your stop is too tight. And that's another problem. And I actually have an article, I think, on my website, The Myth of Tight Stops. People think that, oh, you got to use tight stops, tight stops, tight stops. Well, let me tell you something. More often than not, that's a recipe for disaster. And I've helped so many people just by telling them to loosen their stops, okay? And getting stopped. How does one deal with setting stops and getting stopped out on the one that does run shortly thereafter? Okay, first of all, it happens. Uh, pronounce, uh, spell with a silent sh. Okay, uh, I've I've often poised that question to people in in uh, whenever I'm doing something live in a webinar, or seminar, or whatever. Anyone here ever get stopped out uh, and then uh, almost to the penny and then have to watch the stock take off without them and and, and we all we, that always happens. That that always happens, but it always it always seems to have happened at least to someone in the group. Otherwise, they hadn't been trading that long. So yeah, it does happen. Sometimes you get stopped out, it takes off without you. That's life, okay. And then that's why I do say, well, let's use a little discretion every now and then. And if it comes down, to, let's say we got a stop, STOP at nine, and it comes down to nine, trades at nine, 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 and then bam, ten, eleven, twelve, it goes right back up then we stay with the stock, okay? So that's where using your brain, using your head can actually help you out a little bit, okay? Do I watch level two during the day? No, absolutely not, okay? We're trying to capture a 600% move, a 1,000% move, a 2,000% move, a 10,000% move. I'm not worried about that little zig and zag at your day. Uh, I actually have it for free on my website if you want. This one is free if you're interested. If you come right here, uh, I've got these free videos. Go right here and watch the video. I forget which one it was. I think it was the 19th. Watch this one right here from the 19th. There's some free videos I put out there. There's, these are some weekend charts you might want to watch. Uh, I did put some free ones out here so you can see. But go watch the 19th, and I talked about Tripping over the nickels while going for the dollars, okay? In the words of Grateful Dead, too much of everything is never enough. All right, I'll buy that for a dollar. Okay. Why do you not enter stocks that you miss the entry but long term? They are performing well, and they would be in portfolio if you would have enter. Well, Lewis, you can't kiss all the women, so my methodology is fairly strict in what I do. Uh, I have noticed, and, and this is something that came up during the webinar a couple of weeks ago, the stock selection webinar, 
that uh, IPOs tend to trade a little bit more cleanly and you could be a little bit more lenient with them. And in fact, I'm thinking about doing a methodology or a side methodology just around something like IPOs. Uh, but as far as my core methodology, I know that you can't kiss all the women and that sometimes you might have a stock that doesn't fit the core methodology but then later takes off. Gale is a perfect example of uh, that. And some of my clients got it, and that's what I'm saying. It's not my way or highway. I was like, okay, guys, well, we got this Gale, which we found doing the Sox selection webinar. And uh, I took it off probably somewhere in here because it pulled back too many days, and then look what happened. It took off afterwards. So you can't kiss all the women. Uh, and But if you still like a setup, by all means, then take it. And that's what some of my peeps did, and they did very well on that. Okay. Getting go to webinar was a big time consuming pain in the ass. Gave several choices, wasted time getting the right one. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Getting getting to this webinar? Um, well, I think it was uh, what I did was I set up several. I set up like the next several webinars. So you're you're signed up. If you signed up for today, and you clicked on, tell me the rest of them. Sign me up for the rest. You should be okay. Long a stock overhead is two and a half. Okay, if you're long a stock and you have overhead resistance two and a half to three years away, is it still relevant? Uh, the answer is it depends. It might be. Okay. Uh, but the further back you overhead, like he's saying, you got overhead resistance, and this might be two to three years behind. Uh, go in and watch those. You know what? Go in and watch those videos on my website. I did the – let me show you something here. Uh, it depends on how far back in time it is, but if you watch this one here, no, which one? Oh, right here. This one, an introduction to stock selection. Watch that one, which was a, a, a pimping webinar, pimping webinar for um, my stock selection video. But if you watch that one, you'll see I did talk about overhead resistance. So it depends on uh, how far back in time it is and how far above the price. So if it's 100% above the price, then by all means, so what? But markets do have long memories, so it could. Um, it could be relevant. All right, let me just delete this. The number one long idea for 2014, I don't know, maybe uranium. Maybe uranium. Take a look at URA, okay? But that's not how we roll. We're just going to take things one day at a time. All right, let me finish up on my slides. Just a couple of more things. Um, some random thoughts. Again, just take things one day at a time. Don't try to predict that entire market. For the year, let's just look at it. Don't outdrive your headlights. Let's just take things again one day at a time. Uh, hopefully, higher volatility, lower efficiency will continue to win. I just showed you my list. We had several that were 20, 30, and even 50, 60 percent higher over the last couple of weeks. So that higher volatility, that lower efficiency stock, stocks where things aren't all priced dead, will hopefully continue to win in 2014. Uh, continue to play a good offense. Make sure you you absolutely can't stand it. If you if you could you got a trade and you just can't stand it, then take it. Okay. But if you're like, eh, it's not the best trade I've ever seen. There'll be more. Then pass and be willing to let it take off without you. A couple of announcements here. Um, I mentioned it a couple times in passing. We did have the stock selection webinar a few weeks back. Uh, if you did, uh, in last week I said, or a week before last, uh, did we lose sound? I'm sorry about that. Um, last week I said, now to the end of the year, I extended this out to January 31st because I, I realized it was, wasn't much notice. But anybody who uh, signs up for a year of my service, I'll give them the downloads for the uh, for the webinar. And the webinar was 1460, and that's going to be, uh, probably in a few weeks that's going to be available. By the way, anybody who was at the webinar, I'm going to set up a uh, the follow-up session soon. So um, uh, look at your emails. Maybe later today you'll you have an email. We're going to do one tomorrow at the uh, same time as this show, 10 o'clock Central. Uh, I do have the Week of Charts shows. This is what we're doing now, the Week of Charts. I have all of 2013 archived and ready to go. So if you want those, check my website for more on that. Uh, my first two books are still relevant. Uh, I often use patterns out of those. So um, uh, if you're interested in those, let me know. If you want them both, let me know. I'll cut you a good deal.
on that one. In fact, uh, if you watch this webinar, just get the first one, and I'll give you the second one free. But make sure you put that in the email. Uh, start thinking about your stocks selection picks right now. Start giving me picks, and we'll hop into the um, sectors and look at the overall market and then um, get through the rest. Uh, I'm often asked, Dave, what other books would you recommend? Go to my website. I've got a big list of books I'd recommend you read. It's not just my books. Again, not my way the highway. I do have a trading service. There's some info on that. Again, if you go with the whole year, I'll give you the webinar up until the um, 31st on that. So uh, you got some time on that. And new to trading package, pretty much all of the above. Go to my website and, and take a look at things under education. All right, a couple of questions here, and then we'll, we'll go into it. Okay, low efficiency, that's going to take me a while to explain. That was better explained in the webinar. But efficiency uh, is a stock that has everything priced into it, a big cap stock. Let's just, I'll pull one out the air, McDonald's, okay, where they know what the price of meat is, and they know what the competition is, and you've got 50 analysts, and everybody tends to fight it out, and the stock really doesn't move around a whole lot. So everything isn't priced in. It's very efficient. Everything is, I'm sorry, everything is priced into the stock. It's very efficient. And then you look at, like, uh, that little ja uh, Chinese stock earlier we were looking at, up 60%. That's an inefficient stock because that stock moved up 60% in a couple of weeks. So everything wasn't priced into that stock. That stock was very inefficient, okay? The, uh, the OCIP, which is up about 20% or 30%, I forget which, in the portfolio. Uh, that's an inefficient stock because over the last few weeks, it's gone up about 30%. Okay, overall market, it's only going up a couple percent. So that's a very inefficient stock. Okay. At what point is an IPO no longer an IPO? Well, um, I I look at 50 days or less in my scans to find new IPOs, but I'll like even if a stock's been out a couple of years. For instance, Pandora. It didn't turn into a big winner for us, but Pandora was a good example of that. We got long Pandora. We got a little money out of it, and then it came back in. And my thinking was, even though it wasn't a brand-new IPO and it did in the market for a couple of years, it was right around new highs, and it pulled back, and it had some IPO characteristics to it, meaning that there's not bad memories to it. But, yeah, this I wouldn't call this an IPO anymore. But even though it's only, it's still a fresh stock, fresh on the market, hasn't been on the market for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, or whatever, like McDonald's, okay? And it just just, just tends to top around. I hadn't looked at McDonald's in the Queen's age. Yeah, it just kind of, see, McDonald's just kind of chops around. And you know, this, this move from here to here is just 5% over several months, whereas that particular stock can move, uh, move what, 300% in a year, okay? So that's an inefficient stock, where something like uh, McDonald's kind of flat. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, that's fine. We'll get to those individual s stocks. Let's uh, let's look at the overall market. Howard, we'll get to your, we'll get to that question too. All right. Let's take a look at the market. We'll get to the remaining questions, and we'll uh, certainly start looking at your stock picks uh, too. But let's uh, take a look at the overall market first. And if you do these uh, webinars, what I like to do first is I like to look at the micro and then work my way out to the, mac to the macro, okay? Let's take a look at the peas. Uh, the peas, as you know, had a pretty good day for the last day of the year at all-time highs. And look, today, they're just kind of, eh, not doing so hot, okay? But it's not the end of the world. If you draw a line and look at the recent little breakout, you could see that it was a very persistent breakout, meaning that the market went up day after day after day after day, pretty much, for the most part. And now we're just getting a little bit of a knockout move. I wouldn't get too excited about that. It looks like a little bit of a TKO, kind of a micro TKO, not a big uh, trend knockout, but a little bit of a trend knockout nonetheless based on this little rally out. If you need the trend lockout, Nick, knockout pattern, just let me know. Uh, let's back the chart out a little bit, take a look at things. Obviously, the market's making new highs. That's a good thing. Lots of zigs and zags, but for the most part, you could draw what? A big, in this case, a green arrow. A big green arrow. I often say a big blue arrow because my paint defaults to uh, blue. But you often hear me talk about the big arrows, and that's what they look like. That's the market is going up. 
for the most part over the past several years. So, so far, so good. Now that's pulling back a little bit, by the end of the day, we're going to see a plethora of setups to possibly get long. And we're going to get long if and only if the um, the trend begins to resume. Take a look at the NASDAQ. You can see selling off a little bit in here. Uh, again, not the end of the world so far. Recent little uptrend remains intact. Let me get a... a Okay. That's no time. I meant to get an update before we got started. Um, in fact, we could do that real quick. All right. Any uh, questions in general while I get this update in? Just take a second. There it is. Come on. <laughs> so Howard, you you were long for 3 years on this stock? Wow. We'll take a look at that. Again, a lot of new faces. So when we get to the stocks, I'm not beating you up if I if I talk about the fact that your stock's not trending. It's just that I like to uh, trade stocks, obviously that are trending as a trend follower. We're almost done here. Okay, let's take a look at the quack, and then let's take a look at the. Um, some of the sector action in here and this will only just take a minute because most sectors are looking pretty darn good again NASDAQ uh, pulling back a little bit but so far just that a bit of a pullback so far it's a little uh, breakout remains intact let's take a look at the rusty rusty is the Russell 2000 and it's getting whacked a little bit in here and stocks across the board today so far it's a fairly broad based sell-off and uh, as you know, I like to look at a lot of stocks daily, and I haven't done that just yet because I haven't started my analysis for tomorrow. But I guarantee you tonight I'm going to see a lot of stocks that get hit really hard. And then when I get to the Russell 2000, I'm going to say, oh, Russell got hit pretty hard. So Russell down about a percent in the third so far. The only thing that's a little disappointing in here is that now we're back to the prior little breakout levels. If I were seeing this as a stock, I would say, no, don't buy this stock. Don't buy this stock because it's pulled all the way back to where it's broken out. But it's not the end of the world, okay, because one or two big updates will make all the difference in the world, and we are just uh, less than 2% away from all-time highs. We're at all-time highs coming into today, and now obviously it's sold off a little bit. But not the end of the world, but ideally you want to see it find a little support around 114. Again, that's a Russell 2000. Uh, let's take a look at bonds real quick. I don't. Let's see what's going on there. Uh, bonds down towards their lows. Ideally, I'd like to see bonds kind of stabilize in here and not dip too much below where they are now. I was concerned, as you know, in a lot of 2013, based on the uh, velocity of their slide, which means bonds down, rates up. But we will get a little bit of a lower bond market if the stock market continues higher. And that's okay. Um, I just don't want it to implode. I do like the fact that it's sort of finding support down here. Let's take a look at foreign markets real quick, and then I want to talk quickly about what's going on in the U.S. Now, today notwithstanding, uh, EFA shares are doing pretty good. Now, EFA shares were rolling over in here. And I said, should we worry about that? My point is, well, this is one piece of the puzzle, and it could suggest or could help to suggest how the market is rolling over. But what happens, what I find with these foreign shares is, they begin to roll over, our markets are doing whatever, then all of a sudden our markets take off. What do they do? Well, they take off, okay? So I'm not really sure, as I said quite often, say quite often, I'm not sure if the tail could wag the dog just yet, but it's certainly worth watching. So we're selling off hard today. What are they doing? Well, they're selling off hard today, okay? So let's not get too excited about that. 
just yet, but it does become one piece of the puzzle. So today's action in the EFA shares is abysmal, okay? So today's an ugly day, but the indices, for the most part, still look pretty good. Uh, most areas, and I'm not going to bore you and go through all of them, most areas at or near new highs, even something like chemicals, which is usually not that exciting, are looking pretty good today and, uh, and first, or pretty good recently. And then today is just a bit of a knockout type of move. The energies, which look pretty questionable, they have been crawling back as of late in certain areas like the majors and the pipelines actually were banging out new highs just a couple days ago. Inter uh, metals and mining, another area that looked pretty questionable in here, just but started rallying, okay? Still looks pretty ugly, but then some of the areas within, like steel and iron, as you can see, have broken out now just pulling back. Aluminium and copper. Copper's been kind of going straight up in here. Aluminium down a little bit, uh, but so far you can see its breakout remains intact. So even within some of these weaker sectors like metals and mining, you got areas like gold and silver that are starting to bottom out, and you got areas like aluminium, copper, and steel and iron that are actually on the verge of breaking out or have already broken out. So for the most part, except for a couple of areas like the REITs or something like that that are stinking up the joint, most stocks look pretty darn good in here. Most stocks are at or near new high, so I don't see any reason to go through all these different sectors other than so far they look pretty good. Now, if the market gets a little iffy, we're going to start focusing more on the sector action, but right now things are looking pretty good. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy gold or silver, but it looks like they're trying to bottom out in here. Let's put the bow ties in. Yeah, they haven't really bow tied just yet, but you can see that it's kind of beginning to lose some of that downward momentum. So that could be the next uh, one of the next plays. Uranium I've been bullish on for a while. And uranium is kind of bottomed out in here, as you can see, looking pretty good. Not really set up, but kind of looking pretty good. It's bottoming out. So uh, you need a pick for 2014, uranium. How's that? Okay, uh, we're opening it up for individual stocks now. Richard wants to know about Glog. I never heard about it. I never heard about it. Never heard of it. Is that a thin stock? G L O G. Oh, there it is. Yeah, these shipping stocks, they, uh, that's one thing that came out of the stock selection webinar, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow in a follow-up webinar for those who were actually at the stock selection webinar, is that the shipping stocks were stocks that came up that were, that were making new highs a few weeks back, and then uh, they did follow through a little bit since then. Uh, one problem I have with the shipping stocks is they tend to be wide and loose. Notice this one's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's kind of a Jackie Mason stock. But I'm going to give you an okay on that one. It looks okay, okay? Uh, the only other thing is the rally so far has only been a couple days out since its last base. But it's okay. Uh, it's okay. I, I just can't get that excited about it. Uh, th this one might make my short list, or uh, I should say my Landry list. But at the moment, it's, it's not jumping out at me as a fantastic stock. But I'm going to give it again an okay, not to be too harsh on that. Lewis wants to know about UIS. UIS. Uh, that looks pretty good. Uh, it's kind of wide and loose longer term, though, as you can see. Let's zoom in on a little bit, see if we can pick it apart. Uh, it's okay. And the rally was just a couple days higher, and then it kind of rolled over. But it, yeah, it's certainly worth watching. Maybe a tiny bit more pullback would be a little bit better to knock a few people out. Uh, it's definitely it's definitely not a bad looking stock, okay. And I think that, uh, and I'm going to be a little selective here because I think that with today's action, based on the magnitude of the trend in the overall market and, and, and in so many sectors, I think there's going to be a lot of good looking stocks set up out there, okay. Uh, URZ for Calvin, URZ for Calvin. I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah, it looks okay. It's it's sort of bottom. It's got a lot of bad memories to it, okay? And that's a uranium stock, obviously. But I think these uranium stocks have bottomed out in here. Uh, I have a, I love them because when they go, they, they, they just go. They just go to the moon. Um, but I would wait on this one to see if you can get a little bit past this resistance, maybe if you can get it to like 160 or so. Because you're going to have a lot of people in here in this prior range that might be looking to get out at break even. Um, and then it's going to have some bad memories along the way. But hey, if it gets up to 250, that'd be a good problem to have if you're buying in the in the 160 ish range or so. 
Um, but yeah, keep an eye out on some of those other ones. They might be something a little bit more cleaner. John wants to know about ARMS. ARMS. AMRS. AMRS. Third time's a charm. Okay, my problem with this stock is, and this is something we talked about, and I think it might be in the free webinar. I'll go in and watch it, and, and I'm pretty sure it's in there. But my problem is it's a bit of a bottle rocket. It went straight up. Um, bottle rockets, as I mentioned in, I think, the free webinar and the, and the paid webinar, it, a bottle rocket just kind of goes, and then it fizzles out real quick. It looks like it's going to the moon at first, but then it comes right back in. In this particular case, you've got a stock that went up. You had a $2.50 stock. It went up to 6 over a very short period of time. So that's almost a triple, um, or not quite, but more than a double over a few days. So that's kind of an extreme move. Not that it can't turn around and go right back up, but that is a bit of an extreme move, so I'd be careful. Now, one thing I'll tell you I do like about it, now that I back the chart out, you see this big old fat base in here? One, two years. You had almost two years of basing. So, yeah, this stock could be ripe to go back up to $20, $30 a share. This could be a major, major big winner. My only problem is shorter term is very dangerous in here because it's, it's going straight up and off. So if you do get in this one, just make sure you wait for an entry. Use a liberal entry and be really careful. Okay. Now, cat, I'm not going to like, Doc. Not that I don't like cats, but cats is a, cat is an example of a big, thick stock that's going to be efficient. Okay. Uh, let me get an arrow in here. Notice that the volume here is just tremendous. Let's see, two zeros would be 52 million or 5 million. It's just a big stock, okay? And it's kind of wide and loose in here. So I think you could probably find something better than that. Notice how it's mostly wide and loose. It looks okay because it's trying to break out and pull back a little bit. But I think that you might find something or you should be able to find something much, much better. I mean, even if you just look at this last little move in here, that last little move was 4%, okay? We have stocks that move 4% in a day. Like somebody said earlier, Dave, you've got a stock that went 8% against you. Yeah, well, that's, that's nothing. I mean, that's just, this is how much these stocks can move, okay? Um, so, yeah, you're much better off in something like this, this OCIP or this AERI, that can make those big, huge moves as opposed to something like CAT, which um, doesn't really move around that much, okay? Uh, they're not going to come out tomorrow. They're going to come out and say, oh, we've got a new excavator that could cure the world's problems, and the stock's going to double or triple overnight. But you might have uh, one of those other little stocks come up with uh, some sort of product where, or, or you might have a little inefficient company come up with some sort of fad. It could be burritos or blue jeans or whatever, and that stock might double and triple over a very short period of time. But uh, a big, heavy equipment maker like Caterpillar is not going to have that kind of excitement to it. Don's here and wants to know about F. Well, F is going to be another one of those stocks that's going to be mostly efficient in here. Uh, F looks like hell. Uh, let's put the bow tie moving averages in. you got a bow tie down right here, okay? off of uh, fairly major highs. Uh, this looks like a pretty, actually, for once, it looks like an okay short. Uh, not bad. It, it is a more efficient stock. It can chop around. Uh, the movement from here to here is only two points. Percentage-wise, it's fairly big. But, yeah, that stock's in a lot of trouble. Um, probably the next stopping point would be 13. So you'd have some support there. I wouldn't rush out and short it because I think you're, your upside is limited, especially since the overall market's still doing pretty good. But Don, your Ford not looking too good. Don asks about Ford every week, and nine out of ten times it has nothing to do with the methodology. But that's okay. SPWR for Lewis, yeah, that's one we keep beating a dead horse on. Uh, if you're long, stay long. I don't see any reason to. Uh, our setup was way back here, if you do remember. Right there is where we got in. Um, stay long. Okay, but there's no reason to get in just yet unless it makes new highs and then begins to set up again. So it's not necessarily a new setup, but I think it's uh, worth staying long, well, at least until you stopped out, okay? A-R-I-A, A-R-I-A, A-R-I-A. No, 
No, you got this big gap down here. Okay, you certainly want to avoid that stock at all cost. Um, anybody who owned this stock uh, between 18, anybody who bought it up here, as soon as this thing begins to rally, they're going to look to bail out on that. So just avoid that at all costs. Plug might be okay. Uh, my only problem with plug, it is a bit of a bottle rocket. It kind of went straight up over a short period of time. And you can see it's kind of gotten wide and loose and crazy. So it's not set up. Maybe if it makes new highs and then pulls back, it might be worth a shot. It's got some overhead at four, but I guess that'd be a good problem to have. STEM group and similar type stocks for 2014. Good news will have positive influence on the whole group. Well, it's, yeah, it's possible, but you don't want to rush out and, and, and bet on that. Crocs, that's going to be a big, thick stock that I don't like. Yeah, that's the electrocardiogram. You know, boop, 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 boop. It's just all over the place. It's also a Nicholas Fine stock. No. Let's see if we can electrocardiogram in here. There's your electrocardiogram. <laughs> this is bad. Let's do tar. Let's do a little Tarzan here. This bad. <laughs> this bad. This good. Okay, good. See your little arrow in there. This bad. QTWW. That's gonna be a good. Right? Yeah, it's going up. Why not? I like the way it's at a low level. It's got a little bad memories, but they're so far away. Who cares? They're so far away this way, okay, horizontally, and they're so far away vertically. Who cares, okay? Now, let's look at the micro in here and clean it up a little bit. I mean, this is a stock that's really bottomed out, but it's going to have to break out a little bit more decisively for me to get excited. It's going to have to break out and keep breaking out and then pull back. So maybe if it gets up to 10, pulls back, it might be worthwhile. But right now, I wouldn't see it as a setup. That's Young Frankenstein's movie? <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, it's Frankenstein. Oh, Tarzan, too, right? Good, bad. Yeah, Frankenstein. Fire, bad. LCI is along for Mr. Howard. Uh, no, because it just rallied up to the peak of its prior pullback. Okay, so and that's that's the hard part to look at to understand is that, and this is something we we did spend a lot of time talking about in a webinar. You look at from here to here, and that's a hundred percent move round numbers. I'm sorry, that's even bigger than that. Okay, more than a hundred percent move. So you think that wow, that's a massive up move. Okay, or like you do like that, and then oh, it's just pulled back. But you got to look at the micro, and on a micro basis, it's lost some momentum. Okay, where is it now? Where was it uh, a month ago? You could say exactly one month ago, relatively unchanged for a whole month. Okay, barely got past, barely got past the second peak. If you're long, stay long by all means. Okay, I mean, you could have easily gotten long a few weeks back, and so far, so good. But it's lost, it's lost steam, okay? Short O for Calvin. Short O. Let's take a look at that. Oh. Uh, that's going to be one of those REITs. Um, it's got a tremendous amount of support down here around 35, even though that's a long time ago. I think that's still relevant in this particular case. I, I, again, I'm always getting asked, what's relevant? Well, you had almost a year's worth of trading at one level. So that's that's still very much relevant. Um, I would pass. I would prefer a short coming off of all time highs. Notice we were short like NCR. Um, in that particular case, it's breaking down off of all time highs. Okay. By the way, NCR is a more efficient stock. But Dave, I thought you said you didn't short did trade efficient stocks. Well, sometimes efficient stocks can make for good sh charting. Charting, shorting candidates is kind of just the opposite of uh, what you want to be in for longs. Okay, uh, you got to be if you, if you short an inefficient stock, um, all of a sudden they come out and cure the world's cancer problems or something. Then you're in, in a world of hurt. Whereas a company like NCR begins to roll over, it could be in a lot of trouble. Okay, 
how about two months ago? How H O W or H O W W H O W H O W W? I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, try again, Howard. Facebook and Twitter for Gary. Well, Facebook just got past. The problem with Facebook is it's it's at just getting past its prior little peak in here. If anything, it's a micro first thrust down. I wouldn't short it off that micro pattern, but I certainly wouldn't go long because it barely got past its second peak in here and then came back in. A lot of times a double top, and I've done webinars on this before too, a uh, double top won't always happen in a textbook manner. Sometimes it'll go up and it, it overshoots and then comes in, and a lot of times it'll come up and undershoot and then come in. So this looks like it kind of overshot a possible double top. I would leave that alone. Oh, you want to number Twitter too? SB first, SB. Uh, SB looks pretty good. These shippers, I'm, I'm sort of bullish on these guys. Like I said, a couple of weeks ago, I uh, go back two weeks, and these shippers were coming up uh, as making new highs and maybe worth a look. And, again, this is one thing we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, it's not bad. It maybe needs to pull back a little bit more, maybe just a tiny bit more pullback. But not too much, okay? I'm going to give it a not bad, but just keep in mind that uh, my cadence slipped out. I said bad. A not bad. A not bad on the uh, SB, but it can. Uh, it's funny, years ago I was actually, maybe you need to go to someone. To uh, There are services available to help you get rid of your accent. I'm like, no, why would I do that? I'm proud of my Cajun heritage. <laughs> I think it's charming. <laughs> so, But it does slip out every now and then, so. Uh, but they actually wanted me to do that, which is kind of interesting, but I digress. Uh, a tiny bit more pullback, it might be worthwhile, and I forgot to look at Twitter. Oops, T-W-T-R. Uh, Twitter, so far so good. It's coming out of the pullback. Yeah, I think Twitter looks okay. Twitter's been on my Landry list for a few days in here. Uh, shot higher, pullback, and then, um, yeah, I think it's still viable in here, but it's going to be a wild and crazy ride on that one, so be careful, okay? I should have gone. <laughs> Thank you very little. <laughs> All right, how do I kick somebody out of the webinar? Let me see. How do I do that? Uh, let's see, Jonathan. All right, you're out of here, Jonathan. I'm just kidding. I, I believe me. I got thick skin. I'm not worried about that. I think you got to be pretty tough in this business. Uh, Zoma looks okay. It just really didn't clear that. Well, it looks okay. It's kind of cleared the peak. It came back in a little bit. I would have given it okay. Um. I can't pick it apart too much. It's a little wide and loose. It does have some bad memories, but it's okay. I, I think you could probably find better, but it's still not bad. NM is a shipper. Yeah, that's another one. NM, Bolt. I was looking at a few of these. Now, see, that looks a lot better than that other one. Yeah, that looks pretty excellent. A little dangerous because it's kind of extended, but it still looks pretty good. Uh, who 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 gave me that one? You get a high five. Is that on my land? That's probably on my land list for today. Uh, or it should be. It will be tonight. Uh, good good job, whoever gave me that one. First high five of the day. X for Andrea. X. Uh, yeah, these steel stocks. Now, this is a big, thick steel stock. Um, not bad. Maybe take a look at AKS as an alternative, but it's certainly not set up just yet. But, yeah, keep an eye, keep an eye on maybe like AKX. AKS. Is that symbol? Uh, T and XP. I'm gonna have to go quicker because I I talked too long. Now this one's kind of all over the place, uh, but it looks like it's kind of. I'd like to find out what happened back here. We talked about that last week or week before. Um, it is making new highs, or if it continued to make new highs, like banged out new highs and then pull back, I'll give that a strong maybe. Twitter we just did. We could always send you my Long Island accent. Long Island. <laughs> Low volume. Low volume on what? No, I leave leave cat alone. B, recently at 21. Uh, no, it's that's nothing to do there. I mean, that's just draw your draw your arrows. HSOL, is that a solar stock? Uh, yeah, it's a solar stock. 
I mean, it's too, it's, yeah, it's, it, no, uh, it's too low price to short, but it looks like it's in a downtrend there. That's a solar stock. Doesn't look too good. Hallo, H-A-L-O for Howard. For a second there, I thought you were talking Cajun to me. Hallo. Uh, no, it didn't clear the prior peak enough. Okay, I noticed that it kind of made this pattern here. When in doubt, what do I do? Take the chart out, okay? And see, that's not a good pattern right there. In fact, go in and watch that um, that intro webinar. I did cover a lot of this in there already. Hey, Craig. Uh, CPST, Capstone, let's take a look at that. Uh, no. No, draw your arrow. Uh, and then, you know, also it's an electrocardiogram. Don't make me whip out my electric cardiogram again. <laughs> Stocks that ride the 20-day EMA with daylight and a stop at the 50-day SP works for me. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way of doing it. I mean, I, I talked about that before. Uh, I've often talked about buying stocks when they pull back to moving average. I mean, Linda Rasky called it the Holy Grail. Uh, that's a that's a great pattern. And, and uh, what he's saying is that's a simple little system that makes a lot of sense. He's saying you, you buy a stock when it pulls back to the 50-day moving average. It's kind of like Kiss My Goodbye, which I wrote about in Layman's. And, uh, and he has a stop at the 50-day moving average. Well, that 50-day moving average, what that's going to become in a lot of cases is that longer-term uh, stop that you often see me using, uh, even though I go in each day and I put that stop in. Uh, um, I actually put the stop in based on where I eyeball where it should be. But, yeah, a lot of times that stop is going to turn in. My stop, that is, is going to turn into what appears to be a longer-term moving average. And people always ask me, Dave, is that a longer-term moving average you've got under the chart? And I'm like, no, that's my stop, okay, because that's what it looks like. So, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. That's a, that sounds like a viable system. Uh, good work. YRCW, that's going to be a trucker. YRCW. No, no, it's in trouble. This we were along this one. See, we were along this one back here when it was taken off and pulling back and looking pretty good. But now it's kind of uh, it just kind of looks funky in here. Uh, I'd leave it alone. And, and you know, your HV is 148. It's just too crazy. Okay, Zoma for Peter. So M A. Uh, yeah, we talked about that one. It's okay. I think you could probably find better. Pal, it's be like palladium or something. P A L. Um, my only problem is it's got a lot of overhead supply. I mean, if I was just seeing this, I would say, hey, it's rallying off of lows. It's pulled back. It looks pretty good. But uh, just too much overhead supply. I mean, this thing would really have to rally before I would uh, go after it. Okay. Uh, maybe look at some gold and silver stocks at a bottoming now. I wouldn't rush out and buy them right away because it might be more of a process than an event, but keep an eye on those stocks. Okay, WYY. WYY. Um, hmm. Now it needs a little bit more. It needs a little bit more trend. It needs to continue higher and then pull back. It's kind of lost steam in here shorter term. But I would, uh, I would certainly not kick it out of my radar, kick it off of my, uh, what do you call it, long list, okay? ATHX. You were long? THX. Howard got long ATX said, several years ago at the beginning of the move. Uh, back here? I, I, I can't imagine you stayed long several years, but I could see getting long maybe sometimes, well, maybe not even back then. No, I don't. I don't see it. But if you if you held the congratulations, MGM for Peter. These casinos have been doing pretty good lately. Um, yeah, it's not bad. My only problem with like these casinos and some of these stocks at these these high levels that are big cap stocks, um, and they're not splitting the atom, is that they could be priced for perfection. And you can see that longer term, it's kind of wide and loose, and only more recently it's gotten its act together. So I'm going to say maybe on a pullback, maybe on a TKO. Um, it's not bad, okay? If this was a, a biotech at lower levels or something, I'd say go for it. Uh, but it's not bad on a pullback. I'm going to give it a strong maybe, 
Okay. ONVO. Okay. Uh, no, it's a little too crazy. You'd have to wait for it to break out again to new highs and then revisit that one. It's just all over the place. I'd leave it alone for now. Okay, Martin, we covered Twitter earlier. I think we covered that one. ATI for Ken. Or ATL, ATI. ATI, ATL. Um, it's really too thin. It's also kind of a penny stock. So uh, maybe find something a little bit more. Was that ATI? Maybe find something a little bit more uh, thicker in the metals. If you were talking about ATI, ATI, not bad. Uh, it's a metal fab stock. It has broken out, pulled back a little bit. It's commodity related, so you can be a little bit lenient or a little bit more lenient. I'm going to give it an okay. I just think that we probably could find better stocks out there with the market doing as well as it's been doing lately. Well, look, I see we have some some unanswered questions. I can't get to look. Doesn't look like we'll get to them all this week, but um, just shoot me an email if there's something you want covered. And if I don't get around to doing it in my emails, I'll try to I'll try to answer you. I'll cover it next week's show. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on your schedule. As you can tell, I have a blast doing these things. It's just a lot of fun for me. So I appreciate you coming. Obviously, without you, there isn't a show. Uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Again, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com, any unanswered questions, and I'll try to get to you right away. And if not, uh, it'll be fodder for next week's show. But everybody enjoy the weekend if we don't talk again, and then uh, hopefully I'll see all you guys again next week. Thank you so much.